Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start at the very least on my review of Man's Search for Meaning by Victor E. Frankel. So this is one of those must-read books. I'd heard a lot about it, I spotted it in a charity shop and got chatted to the uh, woman at the charity shop about it, who uh, she was a big fan of this book as well. As always, I'm going to read you the blurb, there's not too much of it there. I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs and I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Dane reads... One of the outstanding classics to emerge from the Holocaust, Man's Search for Meaning, is Viktor Frankl's story of his struggle for survival in Auschwitz and other Nazi concentration camps. Today, this remarkable tribute to hope offers us an avenue to finding greater meaning and purpose in our own lives. Um, it also has an introduction to uh, logotherapy as well, which is the form of psychotherapy that uh, Viktor Frankl espoused. I'm just peeling the label off, don't mind me. There we go, that's much better. So, let's go in and uh, check out some tabs. So um, the preface points out that Frankl is uh, fond of quoting Nietzsche, he who has a why to live can bear with almost any how. Let me just read the first couple of paragraphs to the preface of the 1992 edition. This book has now lived to see nearly 100 printings in English, in addition to having been published in 21 other languages, and the English editions alone have sold more than 3 million copies. These are the dry facts, and they may well be the reason why reporters of American newspapers, and particularly of American TV stations, more often than not start their interviews after listing these facts by exclaiming, Dr. Frankel, your book has become a true bestseller. How do you feel about such a success? Whereupon I react by reporting that in the first place I do not at all see in the bestseller status of my book an achievement and accomplishment on my part, but rather an expression of the misery of our time. If hundreds of thousands of people reach out for a book whose very title promises to deal with the question of a meaning to life, it must be a question that burns under their fingernails. Yeah, good point. He says um, he almost published it anonymously, um, but um, his friends wanted him to publish it with his name. And so he writes, and so it's very strange and remarkable to me that among some dozens of books I've authored, precisely this one, which I'd intended to be published anonymously so that it could never build up any reputation on the part of the author, did become a success. Again and again, I therefore admonish my students both in Europe and in America, don't aim at success. The more you aim at it and make it a target, the more you're going to miss it. For success, like happiness, cannot be pursued. It must ensue, and it only does so as the unintended side effect of one's dedication to a cause greater than oneself, or as the byproduct of one's surrender to a person other than oneself. Happiness must happen, and the same holds for success. You have to let it happen by not caring about it. I want you to listen to what your conscience commands you to do, and go on to carry it out to the best of your knowledge. Then you will live to see that in the long run, in the long run I say, success will follow you precisely because you had forgotten to think of it. So we move on to his experiences in a concentration camp. So he says, um, apart from the selection of capos which was undertaken by the SS, there was a sort of self-selecting process going on the whole time among all of the prisoners. On the average, only those prisoners could keep alive who, after years of trekking from camp to camp, had lost all scruples in their fight for existence. They were prepared to use every means, honest and otherwise, even brutal force, theft and betrayal of their friends, in order to save themselves. We who have come back by the aid of many lucky chances or miracles, whatever one may choose to call them, we know the best of us did not return. Which is brutal, but I can see that. Here we learn something interesting about cigarettes, which I mentioned in my written review as well. Um, just before Christmas 1944, I was presented with a gift of so-called premium coupons. These were issued by the construction firm to which we were practically sold as slaves. The firm paid the camp authorities a fixed price per day per prisoner. The coupons cost the firm 50 fennings each and could be exchanged for six cigarettes, often weeks later, although they sometimes lost their validity. I became the proud owner of a token worth 12 cigarettes. But more important, the cigarettes could be exchanged for 12 soups, and 12 soups were often a very real respite from starvation. The privilege of actually smoking cigarettes was reserved for the capo, who had his assured quota of weekly coupons, or possibly for a prisoner who worked as a foreman in a warehouse or workshop and received a few cigarettes in exchange for doing dangerous jobs. The only exceptions to this were those who had lost the will to live and wanted to enjoy their last days. Thus, when we saw a comrade smoking his own cigarettes, we knew he had given up faith in his strength to carry on, and once lost, the will to live seldom returned. We learn uh, this, the, this, this little bit talks about the thoughts of suicide, which I think would be only natural in a place like this. The thought of suicide was entertained by nearly everyone, if only for a brief time. It was born of the hopelessness of the situation, the constant danger of death looming over us daily and hourly, and the closeness of the death suffered by many of the others. From personal convictions which will be mentioned later, I made myself a firm promise on my first evening in camp that I would not run into the wire. This was a phrase used in camp to describe the most popular method of suicide, touching the electrically charged barbed wire fence. 
It was not entirely difficult for me to make this decision. There was little point in committing suicide since for the average inmate, life expectation, calculating objectively and counting all likely chances was very poor. He could not with any assurance expect to be among the small percentage of men who survived all the selections. The prisoner of Auschwitz in the first phase of shock did not fear death. Even the gas chambers lost their horrors for him after the first few days. After all, they spared him the act of committing suicide. This And this is really sad as well, but obviously, well, obviously a lot of this book is really sad. Uh, he says, I shall never forget how I was roused one night by the groans of a fellow prisoner who threw himself about in his sleep, obviously having a horrible nightmare. Since I'd always been especially sorry for people who suffered from fearful dreams or deliria, I wanted to wake the poor man. Suddenly I drew back the hand which was ready to shake him, frightened at the thing I was about to do. At that moment, I became intensely conscious of the fact that no dream, no matter how horrible, could be as bad as the reality of the camp which surrounded us and to which I was about to recall him. Imagine that, it'd be better to be in a nightmare than in reality. He talks about sex. Um, he does use the term sexual perversion to refer to, to homosexual sex, which obviously is a product of its time. Um, love is love. Anyway, he says, undernourishment, besides being the cause of the general preoccupation with food, probably also explains the fact that the sexual urge was generally absent. Apart from the initial effects of shock, this appears to be the only explanation of a phenomenon which a psychologist was bound to observe in those all-male camps, that, as opposed to all other strictly male establishments, such as army barracks, there was little sexual perversion. Even in his dreams, the prisoner did not seem to concern himself with sex, but those frustrated emotions in his inner higher feelings did find definite expression in them. We learn about art and humour and how that was represented in the camps. To discover that there was any semblance of art in a concentration camp must be surprise enough for an outsider, but you may be even more astonished to hear that one could find a sense of humour there as well. Of course, only the faint trace of one, and then only for a few seconds or minutes. Humour was another of the soul's weapons in the fight for self-preservation. It is well known that humour, more than anything else in the human makeup, can afford an aloofness and an ability to rise above any situation, even if only for a few seconds. I practically trained a friend of mine who worked next to me on the building site to develop a sense of humour. I suggested to him that we would promise each other to invent at least one amusing story daily about some incident that could happen one day after our liberation. He was a surgeon and had been an assistant on the staff of a large hospital. So I once tried to get him to smile by describing to him how he would be unable to lose the habits of camp life when he returned to his former work. On the building site, especially when the supervisor made his tour of inspection, the foreman encouraged us to work faster by shouting, action, action. I told my friend, one day you will be back in the operating room performing a big abdominal operation. Suddenly an orderly will rush by, announcing the arrival of the senior surgeon by shouting, action, action. Sometimes the other men invented amusing dreams about the future, such as forecasting that during a future dinner engagement, they might forget themselves when the soup was served and beg the hostess to ladle it from the bottom. Because during uh, the concentration camps, that was where the uh, peas were. The attempt to develop a sense of humour and to see things in a humorous light is some kind of a trick learned while mastering the art of living. Yet it is possible to practice the art of living even in a concentration camp, although suffering is omnipresent. To draw an analogy, a man's suffering is similar to the behaviour of gas. If a certain quantity of gas is pumped into an empty chamber, it will fill the chamber completely and evenly, no matter how big the chamber. Thus, suffering completely fills the human soul and conscious mind, no matter whether the suffering is great or little. Therefore, the size of human suffering is absolutely relative. Incredible quote here, which I kind of agree with as well. Um, the words of Bismarck, life is like being at the dentist. You always think that the worst is still to come, and yet it is over already. And I relate to that as well because I hate going to the dentists. And the worst is yet to come thing, that's, you know, that's anxiety. All right, so let's learn a little bit about logotherapy, which is his uh, particular form of therapy. And uh, here on the, on the meaning of life, he writes, I doubt whether a doctor can answer this question in general terms. For the meaning of life differs from man to man, from day to day and from hour to hour. What matters, therefore, is not the meaning of life in general, but rather the specific meaning of a person's life at a given moment. To put the question in general terms would be comparable to the question posed to a chess champion. Tell me, master, what is the best move in the world? There simply is no such thing as the best or even a good move, apart from a particular situation in a game and the particular personality of one's opponent. The, game, the same holds for human existence. One should not search for an abstract meaning of life. Everyone has his own specific vocation or mission in life to carry out a concrete assignment which demands fulfilment. Therein he cannot be replaced, nor can his life be repeated. Thus everyone's task is as unique as his specific opportunity to implement it. And some more on finding meaning. So he says, let me cite a clear cut example. Once an elderly general practitioner consulted me because of his severe depression. He could not overcome the loss of his wife who had died two years before and whom he had loved above all else. Now, how could I help him? 
What should I tell him? Well, I refrained from telling him anything, but instead confronted him with the question, what would have happened, doctor, if you had died first and your wife would have had to survive you? Oh, he said, for her, this would have been terrible. How she would have suffered. Whereupon I replied, you see, doctor, such a suffering has been spared her, and it was you who have spared her this suffering, to be sure at the price that now you have to survive a mourner. He said no word, but shook my hand and calmly left my office. In some ways, suffering ceases to be suffering at the moment it finds a meaning, such as the meaning of a sacrifice. And he writes about paradoxical intention, which he says is no panacea, which means it's no uh, cure-all. Um, but basically, it's the idea that you set your like that you set your intent uh, to be the opposite. So, for example, he cites a guy who um, he had a severe stutter, and the only time in his life he didn't stutter was when he got caught going on a bus and didn't pay the fare. And he was like, "I'm going to play up my stutter so that they feel sorry for me." And suddenly, he stopped stuttering. Um, he says paradoxical intention can also be implied, applied in cases of sleep disturbance. The fear of sleeplessness results in a hyperattention to fall asleep, which in turn incapacitates the patient to do so. To overcome this particular fear, I usually advise the patient not to try to sleep, but rather to try to do just the opposite, that is, to stay awake as long as possible. In other words, the hyperintention to fall asleep, arising from the anticipatory anxiety of not being able to do so, must be replaced by the paradoxical intention not to fall asleep, which soon will be followed by sleep. He also says the fear of sleeplessness is, in the majority of cases, due to the patient's ignorance of the fact that the organism provides itself by itself with the minimum amount of sleep really needed. Um, and as a hardcore insomniac, I found that fascinating. And it's true, like it is always, you know, I won't be able to sleep. And then if I'm like, okay, I'm gonna stay up all night to reset my sleeping pattern, inevitably I then fall asleep. I like this line as well. He says, freedom, however, is not the last word. Freedom is only part of the story and half of the truth. Freedom is but the negative aspect of the whole phenomenon whose positive aspect is responsibleness. In fact, freedom is in danger of degenerating into mere arbitrariness unless it is lived in terms of responsibleness. That is why I recommend that the Statue of Liberty on the East Coast be supplemented by a Statue of Responsibility on the West Coast. It just ends the book with a quote that I think is very uh, apt. He says, so let us be alert, alert in a twofold sense. Since Auschwitz, we know what a man is capable of. And since Hiroshima, we know what is at stake. So yeah, really interesting book for, for two perspectives, really. I mean, I'm always interested in Second World War stuff anyway. And obviously it's, it's very important that we have books like this that have got this first-hand account of what it was like to live in a concentration camp. Um, but equally, I really enjoyed the stuff about um, logotherapy. I suppose that's the only bit you can say you actually enjoyed because the Auschwitz stuff, concentration camp stuff is obviously um, very harrowing. But the logotherapy stuff was also really fascinating and kind of, I don't know, taught me things. So yeah, uh, I gave Man's Search for Meaning by Victor E. Frankl a four out of five. So there we have it. That's what I made of Man's Search for Meaning by Victor E. Frankl. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book. If you read it, hit that like button. If you've enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button for more. And I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.